Everybody wants to own the end of the world. This is what my father said, standing by the contoured windows in his New York office, private wealth management, dynasty trust, emerging markets. We were sharing a rare point in time, contemplative, and the moment was made complete by his vintage sunglasses, bringing the night indoors. I studied the art in the room, variously abstract, and began to understand that the extended silence following his remarks belonged to neither one of us. I thought of his wife, the second, the archaeologist, the one whose mind and failing body would soon begin to drift on shadow into the void. This is the beginning of Zero K by Don DeLillo. I, I go back to Don DeLillo because, because uh, the idea of uh, the end of the world and uh, because the time we are living in, the idea of the end of the world uh, is going on, uh, is going on in my head and goes and goes on. And uh, it reminds me the Bergamo situation where the coffin were taken away by military trucks or reminds me the song by R.E.M. Um, it's the end of the world as we know it now or Mike Fisher and Donnie Darko the movie the philosopher and the movie and so uh, it is an idea that uh, goes on in my mind and uh, returns uh, a few days ago I had a, a chat uh, with my friend Ferdinando and uh, he told me that uh, we were distracted when the end of the world happened, really. And uh, it made sense for me. It was uh, clearly the, the photograph of this situation. And uh, I arrived to, to Don De Lillo because, uh, in my opinion, he's one of the writers, uh, and Ferdinand agrees with me. Uh, we were talking about this situation, this Don De Lillo, Don De Lillo attitude. And uh, I think he was... He, could be one of the, uh, the authors able to write a novel about this, uh, this pandemic because of, uh, to quote Martin Emis, his antenna of visionary. But uh, he's not the, the only one, in my opinion, who could afford to write this novel about our present days. And uh, one of uh, the other authors in which I believe and I love and uh, in which I think they could be writers of the great novel. I'm so happy to invite Tom to join the, our live here at Radio Gamek on the 28th day and the 42nd day of my personal quarantine. So we see your living room, Tom. You have to... Okay. Hi, Tom. Welcome. Hello. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm quite fine. I was a little in trouble because, but now you're here and I'm happy and everything is working in the right, in the right way. So Tom, Tom is the author of a Reminder, an incredible novel and there's many other books such as Saturn Island and is one of my favorite authors because of his relevant vision and interpretation of the times through the lens of the novel. Uh, Tom, uh, but uh, your works is, to quote a, a Jasper Jones show, something resembling truth, in my opinion. And the, the first question is a very simple question. And what is truth in literature now for you? <laughs> so simple. What is truth? Yes. What is truth? I was jesting pilot and did not stay for an answer. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the beginning of an essay by Francis Bacon. Um, what, what is truth? I don't know. Truth is uh, a, a friend of mine, um, Lawrence Rickels, the critic, he quotes uh, Kafka saying that we, we exist in a holding pattern around truth, like an aeroplane in a holding pattern around an, an airport. Mm. And it's a beautiful quote, the idea of being in a holding pattern around truth as a writer, but you never quite land. And I asked, I asked Lawrence, uh, where, where does Kafka say that? 
And he said, oh, I can't remember. And he went and looked in all his books and he couldn't find it anywhere. <laughs> and nobody could find it. And <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe Kafka doesn't say it, but it's a beautiful line. Tom, uh, you wrote a novel about uh, re-enacting, you know, a reminder was a book about re-enacting. Now we are re-enacting our life each day, 24 hours per day during the, this quarantine. Uh, which exit strategy can we imagine from our reenacting our lives? And uh, can culture in some way help us, in your opinion? No. I mean, I, I don't think culture is here to help. I don't think culture is here to help. You know, when I get these emails that say, send a friend a poem to make them feel better, I just press delete. <laughs> um, I, I don't think this is what, what poetry is. It's not, it's not some palliative. It's not some uh, Prozac. It's much more interesting than that. I mean, literature is... is, is um, Literature doesn't reflect the world. It it creates it in a way, you know. I mean, it, it it's here to construct to construct the frames of reality or the frames of our understanding of what reality might might be. Um, and it, I, I, you know, this pandemic has made me think that literature always has quite an intimate relationship with illness and virus. Idea. We we could think of the work of someone like William Burroughs, who was obsessed with the idea of the word is a virus, you know, transmission, contagion. Um, or we could think all the way back to Ovid and his writing of the plague at Aegina. Yeah. Um, illness, desire, intoxication. Um, I don't think literature is here to take us away from this, but to put us maybe deeper into, into this kind of intoxicated or contagious states of being. Uh, in Staten Island, your character, you has to write the great report on our society. And uh, he, he writes no, no word about in, in this report. But the novel maybe is the great report on our society. Uh, who could uh, we write now a great report from this present, this unprecedented situation? What can we, uh, as an anthropologist, imagine ourselves in this time, Tom? Yeah, well, the problem that, that my hero in that novel, the anthropologist, the problem he encounters is that the world does not need an anthropologist or a novelist to represent it. Already the networks of kinship are being mapped by data, by Facebook, by Amazon. You know, the, uh, all of our movements are being recorded. The book is being written. You know, if we just walk down the street already, this has been notated in a, in a data bank. There is a big black box in the desert in Arizona that nobody can read. You know, even the FSA can't read their own book. So this is, it becomes a theological question. You know, the book, the book is all around us. We're living is what J.G. Ballard said. I saw you, you know, I know you like, um, we live inside a giant novel. The question is, you know, how to read, and it, it's a political question and, and a literary question. What are the stakes? What are the, what are the strategies of, of readership and interpretation? Who gets to read what? Who gets to, who gets to access the data? Yes, you at the final decide to act instead of writing. So maybe this is also another message of the book in some way. We should act and not write, but we read the story. And so the circle goes on. And that, this is literature, in my opinion, the magic of literature in some way. Yeah, it's also tied to passivity. I mean, I guess at the end of Saturn Island, you know, the anthropologist, he has fantasies of becoming a revolutionary, a kind of uh, Ulrike Meinhof, yeah. Patty Hearst figure. But he doesn't do this in the end. He becomes kind of passive in the way he ends up a bit like Melville's Bartleby, someone who is you know, as, as uh, the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben says, who is radically passive. Yeah. This form of passivity is an infinite potential. Maybe this is what literature can bring, not, not, not some kind of active transformation of the world, but a, 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 an infinite potential through um, delay, through deferral, through a, through a form of kind of, yeah, passivity.
Yeah. You wrote an essay about uh, Ulysses, Joyce Ulysses, and uh, you say that uh, its publication was an event in equal parts, ecstatic and catastrophic, maybe apocalyptic. Yeah. Uh, now we have a sort of apocalypse around us, and uh, can we expect another masterpiece like Ulysses for our time? Can we be so lucky to have it? Let's hope so. I mean, there's, there's always, you, you, you know, J Joyce thought that Ulysses or actually Finnegan's Wake, the next one, would be the final book. This would be the end of the book. And, and I've tried to argue that he was exactly, exactly wrong. It was, it was the first book. It's like the possibility of the book. It's not even a finished book. It's like the opening up of, of a field of possibility. And this is what I think literature at its best does, not completed works, but a kind of breaching of new possibilities. So the great work, the great work of the pandemic era or the 21st century or any period is always to come. It's always to come, it's never now. Um, and that's, that's what's so exciting. Even Ulysses is not the great work. It's just a, an opening up of the possibility of, of, a, of a great work. Go back to Kafka, Tom, for the last question. Uh, you also write essays about Kafka and uh, uh, in this present time, I'm feeling uh, the pressure of new controls, of new sovereign structure that are monitoring mm. our movement, our wealth, our health. And uh, it's uh, like in the castle or in, uh, or in the trial, no? And um, are we moving, in your opinion, towards an Orwellian or a Kafkian future in some way, or present, because it's now? Yeah, I mean, sure. This is the thing that the, the more that um, the more that data, you know, streamlines itself, the closer we get to totalitarian um, control, but also the more possibilities for kind of diversion, digression, detournement and so on open. It's, it's, I think it's a double edged thing. It's uh, it's dystopian, but also full of possibility um, for imaginative uh, rethinkings. You quote the story. Maybe this is the part of the poet as well, as well as the political agent, is to imaginatively rethink the network. You quote the dystopia and uh, my mind reminded me to utopia. Uh, is it still useful to have in mind a word like utopia or now it's unuseful uh, because uh, everything goes too much over? Yeah, I think it's useful. I mean, utopia literally means no, no place. It, it's nowhere. It's nothing. It's, 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 not, it's not something that could actually be achieved. It's a, it's a kind of a possibility, a, a, an opening within, within the present, you know, within, within what is. And, and uh, you know, a, an opening to, to, to something that might be different. And... Um, and I think that's always the space of, it's an important, um, it's an important place. It's the, it's, it's, it's the, the avenue of, of desire and the imagination. And so, yeah, we should always, we should always think of utopias, but, 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 but if they're realized, they're not utopia anymore. They're just topos. <laughs> Tom, can you, do you think that the jellyfish will save our world after us in some way? Do I think who will save our world? The jellyfish. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they can save uh, the world, not us, but the world. Maybe they can save our world. The jellyfish. I don't know if they'll save it. They'll inherit it. The original for Freud, jellyfish are the original writing machines. Before the typewriter, before the human nervous system, the first trauma ectoplasm that records and transmits is the, I have is the jellyfish. So, so then maybe this is not a problem for us. This is a problem for the jellyfish. <laughs> okay, um, it was fantastic having you here and I... Thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, I hope to meet you by person in the future. I hope so too. My love to everyone in Bergamo and everywhere else. Thank you, Tom. We go on and we are so much proud to have you here. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. Good night. So, uh, Tom uh, is really one of the most relevant authors, in my opinion, in, in our international scene because of his vision of his capability to, to, to create literary objects that go beyond. 
And uh, I quote Reminder, I quote Satin Island, there is also C, who was a great uh, and important novel, but uh, his way of writing is somehow a kind of uh, performance. And uh, so it's linked with the uh, arts and uh, the way we try to, to understand the world starting from art pieces that can be literary pieces or visual art and so on. Uh, so we have to go back to consider arts and uh, in art institution. So our second guest is a, a curator and uh, I can say a friend and uh, he's Andrea Lissoni from London. Andrea, ciao, how are you? Ciao, how are you? I'm fine, and you? Okay. Fine, you? Okay. Perfect. 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 There is a yes. uh, sound. Uh, found, uh, I listen to my I voice. To my voice. Oh gosh, do you want me to plug a um, plug in? If you can, maybe you can, maybe can help us because can help us. my voice reminds. Okay, give me like right. one right. minute. Please, please, okay. go on. And I, uh, yeah, yeah, the curator yeah, at yeah. was curator at Gabi in, in Milan, and to take water, and, and now uh, appointed director of Munich, and, uh, and uh, he's one he's of the. Uh, most uh, important curator, Italian curators in the international scene. And uh, he's here to, tell, to talk, we want to talk with him about, uh, about, uh, can you listen to me? Can you hear? Yes, perfect. perfect. Okay. Is it okay for you? And, uh, we can start from a uh, sure. cultural institution and this emergency. Uh, how are they dealing with this unprecedented situation. What are they doing in, to face this situation? Well, um, long story short, they are trying to, of course, to adapt. I think there is no better moment, no more unfortunate moment to uh, remark how the world is still divided in time zones. And when I'm talking about time zones, I, I really mean political, economical and, and different behaviors within institutions. So that reminds me actually, <laughs> reminds me a lot actually of, of Tom Sutton Island, uh, which to me was the best book ever uh, depicting that moment in time. I remember this beautiful image of the buffering. Uh, we were mm -hmm. yeah, in a yeah it was incredible, incredible. The time is frozen, but this was the first book that affected my specific feeling of what time zones are. What happened in 2001 will be unforgettable for me as an Italian. And what happened in 2001 was this disaster, this awful attack against the citizens in Genoa. What happened in 2001, two months after was 9-11 and this delayed it completely the memory of the uh, awful behavior um, of, the, of a police state against citizens of all Europe. So I'm, I'm mentioning, I'm referring to Tom McCarthy, uh, Southern Island, because what's happening now is that on the one hand, we are facing the still somehow lucky situation of what a public institution means in Europe, where a public institution can really make sure that it grounds and it lives thanks to the public support, and it will be surviving thanks to the public support. Whilst uh, other institutions, like the, for instance, the American ones, will be definitely struggling. And there is no doubt, because they are supporting the public institution, they are open to the, the public, but they are not owned by the state, besides some very few um, public um, art centers owned by public universities. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is, in the US, you have um, museums for law, like um, temporarily uh, firing employees and struggling to put contents online. In Europe, I mean, I'm just talking about the contemporary and modern art scene. The problem of, you know, firing people is not there yet, luckily. And the, the, the tentative is trying to think about how the future will be. And of course, putting contents online as much as possible Institutions have got a collection are uh, trying to highlight a collection in different ways. Institutions that are more like Kunsthallen or art center with no collection are trying to make shows visible with different tools, be streaming videos or being having Zoom conversations or being 
um, allowing the audience to walk virtually in the spaces. Of course, there are also very beautiful mo moments and movements. For instance, um, one reference, um, the museum director, uh, Manolo Borja Villel, the director of the Reina Sofia in, in Madrid, a town uh, that has been affected dramatically, like Bergamo and like Milan, has invented a system of commission that in collaboration with two other, uh, with more museums, like connected between them from um, um, an association called L'Internationale, and in particular with the Van Abben Museum in, in Netherlands and the MUCA in Antwerp, they commission performances for the balconies. Mm -hmm. So there is this beautiful moment of um, artists thinking about what a performance can be in the contemporary public space, the one that is connecting us all, and that is, in this specific moment, more a balcony than a square. So I'm just drawing some, some examples. Of course, in Southeast Asia, museums are opening, are reopening after the, the first uh, terrible wave. So it, it's somehow interesting to see how, how the world is behaving uh, differently in different time zones, yeah. in different economical conditions. And do you think, Andrea, that uh, we can, uh, we could, uh, need uh, an international great uh, public art project to support uh, culture uh, that was uh, called by Anstro Recovers, for example, or Stefano Boer here in our, in our conversation. They called for uh, a great project uh, uh, with public art to support uh, artists, galleries and museums. Do you think it will be useful for our system? I'm not sure. I mean, to some extent, I'm sure about what Tom McCarthy says. I'm not sure art is there to react. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure art is there to intervene in the um, present time. I am aware that there are wonderful artists that are very good at um, dealing with communities and triggering changes, but changes are never in real time. So I wouldn't necessarily call art to, to produce something that uh, fundraising. I mean, it's, it's, it's a strange mechanism. It's a mechanism that is an old, old days mechanism. Uh, recent days, I think that this way of intending art is perhaps over um, with some financial ambition and, and some combination between finances and marketing. And I imagine that an alliance between public hardcore institution uh, that deeply believe in what does it mean pub mm, public institution today can trigger far more than a monument, which will be inevitably temporary, far more than a sign. And believe me or not, I, be, I guess the, the, even the biggest public institution now are going to face the most wonderful and trembling task, which is acting locally, becoming important becoming the institution that locally mirrors in the world and also triggers changes, real changes, not changes that are like changes for some elites that are circles of supposed you know, associations and, and friendships. I think now what needs to happen is that the sense of behold, I mean, the sense of, yes, being part, uh, becomes the crucial task of a public institution locally. And of course, then we can all, all like decide for a public monument that we, 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 we put on our um, walls or we, we stream in the sky or we stream online. And this could be a wonderful gesture to, to raise support for artists. And this we should, we should definitely work on. But the priority, I'm sorry to say, is where we are or we are going to be. It's not how, how well we are connected. We are already all well connected, but we need to game change locally. And that's the, that's the first task. Because as I still believe and will be forever, the main claim in the last mm, years about the museum being a safe space is true. The museum is safe. The museum is the safest place you can imagine. There hasn't been any attack into museums yet, luckily. So that safe condition needs to be preserved. And the feelings that we have in these safe spaces that are 
meant to transmit contemporary and future values to me is crucial, but this is really local, unfortunately. It's no longer global. This is very important for us in Bergamo, for example, no? to imagine a, a small city that uh, becomes uh, uh, the center of the world in some way for a tragic situation, but uh, what you say gave us a perspective, a, an idea of uh, what the cultural institution can do. Do you think it will be possible all over the world? And uh, it, uh, it can be a, a sort of a scheme that we can apply in different situations, what you said before, just before. I think so. I think so. There are already really good um, devices that connect institutions, like there is a, a terrific device called the ICOM. Um, and there is even a more specific connecting only uh, contemporary art institution. And it's, it's nothing bureaucratic. It's really made by human beings and by people. Institutions are public, but are always run by human beings. And yeah. these human beings, these groups of human beings, produce this sort of choir, the dissonant choir that makes, makes, makes life, right? So, um, of course, there can be, a, 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 there must be uh, an improvement of this sort of idea of coalition, let's call it as such. But I really believe it's time to be very local and to act very local with mirroring the experience we have and, and mirroring what, what's happening um, all over the world and what's happening in Game, with Game in Bergamo to me was mind blowing. I mean, I'm, I'm in, an institution that instead of thinking about itself, thinks about the hospital, yeah. thanks to art. That's, that's what, how the, uh, the contemporary art institution should, should be and should work. This is admirable and moving. And, 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 and this is how it should be. So it's not about putting out a sign that says, stay home, because this is someone else that has this rule, but making sure that the community that you build, which is a community of artists at first, manage to be generous. And that's what we want to do. We want to be generous and we want to be generous towards uh, who needs. Uh, the support that we can give that is of course more cultural food than 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 financial or symbolic food this is yeah this is what i believe but I, maybe it's simple to say and not and not simple to to do but actually what happened at gamak is a really good example for how to go ahead with uh, um, with generating something else it's not about telling who i am and the sort of history i have as institution it's how can the institution generate something else into the territory. That's the dream. You, you are talking about human beings uh, now, uh, and, uh, and uh, artists also are human beings, and you work with them, you are in touch with them. How are they living uh, this situation with this isolation? Uh, do you think that they can use this time to produce more, or it's in a way a difficult time also for artists? It is inevitably a difficult time. It's, a, um, it's, a, it's also somehow a cut uh, into, for the more privileged, the possibility of moving into the um, studio, in the atelier. Yeah. For some other one, the impossibility of moving outside the familiar, let's say, constellation. Or, this, or, or the, the nucleus, the new families nucleus they, they are embedded into. Um, for most, the, the main question is how, what does it mean to exchange and how can we still exchange and, and support each other? Um, so yes, inevitably it is, it is a tough time, but we learn um, that during the Second World War, and I'm sorry now to think about a male artist, but Giacometti managed to scale completely differently his work. And he managed to imagine how, what does it mean to, to stick on sculptures and reinvent sculpture working on size and different size. And that was a game changing gesture into the history of sculpture. And that's now I'm referring, I'm referring to, to 20th century. I am now thinking about um, Alexandra Pirici, a uh, wonderful um, uh, Romanian artist who works with her, with, her, with her body mostly. And she invented a system of being tuned to a performance that nobody sees and that, she's, that she even doesn't stream th throughout the world. But being tuned means some bodies are dancing a playlist that she and her peers share a couple of 
hours before the event to happen. So how to be alone, be attuned to someone else. This is a wonderful artistic choice and, and gesture. And just like uh, quoting something that came to my mind or some are also creating like Marianne Benneni is uh, making terrific works, really terrific videos that she uh, delivers more or less once a week through her Instagram account. And I'm sure that a museum is going to acquire them. I'm sure that a museum is going to stream them very soon. And they're really wonderful portraits of the city of New York in this moment, seeing from her perspective, but also seeing from the way she sees the world. So I could continue for hours. I'm tendentially optimist. <laughs> and the last question was about the future, but in some way you still answer me because uh, what you described was a vision of the future. There is one thing or two things you want to add uh, in uh, the posture that uh, cultural institution and you also as a person are looking at the next job to do? Supporting, producing. Um, there is always a different pace. There are institutions that have like the weight, the wonderful weight of, of a collection. They pay Pompidou steadily to quote the big ones, but also to quote the most relevant one like Gamek. And the other one that um, luckily blessed by, <laughs> I say, not having a collection, <laughs> it's not necessarily a blessing, can be a problem, <laughs> uh, and it is a problem. I would say those that, uh, that don't carry on this, this weight of a collection to be constantly reinvented and shared, have the luxury to support artists. And this is what they should do. They should produce. And what does it mean producing? Nowadays, does it mean making objects, circulating all over the world, like what jeopardized our own, let's say, current days? Maybe not. Maybe you can produce something else. And what you can produce and support is one of the biggest challenges that we should all face. So I, am, I feel that this is, this is like a, a line that needs, needs to be considered, at least if not followed. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much. We could go on for hours, but our time is over. So I, I send you a great hug and uh, I hope to, to meet you again as soon as possible. And uh, as you know, ti voglio bene, lo sai. Grazie. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations for such amazing initiative. And thank you. all my thoughts are always with Bergamo. Thank you, Ander. See you. Bye bye. Okay. Good night. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Uh, it was uh, we had two two great uh, two great uh, guests tonight, and they said uh, things that uh, have a weight, have a sense, made sense. And uh, the, considering the last uh, sentences by Andrea, uh, it's uh, it's a vision of the future. This idea that the museums uh, had to become lo more local and to act in community because it will be difficult to return and maybe not useful to return to the previous situation with so this enormously globalization of culture. Uh, maybe we need to stay where we are and to act where we are without uh, with conserving a, a global way of thinking, but being able to be also local. This is maybe one of the message that we'll have to remind when the door will be reopened and something like normal life will, will return in Italy and all over the world. Um, so I, I really have to thank you, to thank Andrea and uh, Tom for joining us. And uh, even if Tom said that uh, if someone asked him to send a poem to help uh, other people, he'd say, no, I delayed the message. I want uh, to read anyway a poem tonight, such a, uh, in uh, every final step of our live session at the Radio Gamek. And uh, tonight it's uh, a, another classic. It's part of the Wasteland by T.S. Eliot. An real city, under the brown fog of a winter dawn. A crowd flowed over London Bridge. So many, I had not thought that had undone so many. Sights, short and infrequent, were exhaled, 
and each man fixed his eye before his feet. Flood up the hill and down King William Street to where St. Mary Woolnoth kept the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. There I saw one I knew and stopped him crying, Stetson, you were with me in the ships at Mille. That corpse you planted last year in your garden as it began to sprout. Will it bloom this year? Or has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? Oh, keep the dog far hence, that's friend to man. Or with his nails, he'll dig it up again. You, hypocrite lecturer, mon semblant, mon frère. There was also a final Baudelaire quotation in the, the life is over. Another, another adventure tonight uh, is gone with the Saturday Night Live at Radio Galmec. I'm, uh, I'm so tired, but so happy that uh, you join us. And uh, I want uh, to thank you, each one of you here tonight uh, for following us. Radio Galmec goes back to Italian spoken language tomorrow morning on Sunday at uh, 11.30. And uh, the next uh, Saturday Night Live will be held the next Saturday, as the world say. So thank you so much to each one of you, and uh, I love you all, and um, that's all. Thank you for joining us, and uh, don't uh, give up. Thank you from Gamek, Radio Gamek and Bergamo. We say good night uh, to all uh, the world. Good night. <laughs>